Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dora Nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. <laughs> I guess we explain at some point today, we're just, we're just talking. This is just you and I having a conversation. This is kind of an episode. Yeah. Kind of not yeah. an episode. So today, uh, it's me and Paddy having a chat about Cormac McCarthy adaptions. So we're going to have a little chat about some of Cormac McCarthy's books mm-hmm. and that were turned into films. And I guess how we felt about those films. Yes, um, how about? we felt about those films. <laughs> oh, boy. It's my diplomatic way of saying that. <laughs> yeah. Is it fair to say Cormac McCarthy is one of your favorite authors? Is that a fair statement? I don't know if I've read enough of his books to say that, but I have been very impressed with the few I have read. I read The Road, I read No Quitch for Old Men, and I read Blood Meridian. And Blood Meridian is a book that I was really fascinated by out of, out of the three of those. How about you? He's, he's one of your favorites, is he? Well, you know, I want to say yes, but I've read fewer than you. But I, you know, that's okay. never stopped me in the past. I'm going to say he's a favorite. So yeah. The Road, I thought, was staggeringly good. And Blood Meridian is one of my favorite books. I also started All the Pretty Horses, which I I wasn't in the right headspace. I think I was too young. It went over okay. my head. I need to come back to it because, yeah, Cormac McCarthy deserves a lot of attention. It's not an easy read. Yes. Yeah, I do find his writing is something you really have to sit down with and kind of digest it. Mm. This is a little off subject, but a friend of mine recently sent an article, which I haven't read. Lauren, I'm, I'll get to it. I will get to it. Uh, okay. It was titled, I think, something like, the joy of reading texts you don't fully understand, which for me sums up the Cormac McCarthy experience so well. I don't always understand what he's talking about, but I I love being lost in it and trying to find the meaning and, you know, discover the profundity under the puzzle a lot of the time. I don't yeah. know if that, maybe I'm just a dummy and you're like, no, this is, it's really obvious. It's really easy stuff. No, 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 I'm very, very much the same. Um... It becomes something kind of like music. I'm thinking as well of like when I was younger reading some oh. of H.P. Lovecraft's passages that I felt like I didn't necessarily understand, but I was definitely feeling the tone Yes, of what was being said and yes. some of his writing a little bit convoluted. And I always enjoyed that. And I think it becomes a little bit like in, in, in the one sense, writing a story is trying to transfer like the writer's imagination, the writer's thoughts onto the page and then for you to interpret them in a pretty close way. Mm-hmm. So if it becomes a little bit more complex or a little bit less accessible, sometimes we think of that as bad writing, but sometimes if the tone, if the emotions, yes. if these things are still being evoked, it's the same. And yeah, I feel like it becomes a little bit more like poetry, a little bit more like music when that's happening. It's such a tricky thing as well, because like, you're right, you can do it in a bad way where it's just like, this isn't clear enough. And I don't, mm. that could be a podcast subject in and of itself. I have no idea where the line is between ambiguity Absolutely. that's yeah. bad because it doesn't make sense and ambiguity that's good because it might make sense. Can you work it out? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah, I, I don't quite know how writers tell themselves where it is they're landing. How do no. they know? Like, yeah. who are they testing it with? So, you know? Or how well, the editor knows because, I mean, imagine getting a manuscript and you're reading it and you're like, this is really good, but I don't really understand what's being said here. Do you tell the writer, this needs to be clearer because I don't understand it? Or you tell the writer, look, I got to trust you. This this seems like genius and just run with it. I, I don't know. I'm in this exact, I'm in this exact conundrum. Oh, don't, uh, real world examples. This is good. Yeah. yeah. Don't take offense. I've, I've joined a writing group, um, another writing group. Um, it's obviously I feel, I feel absolutely betrayed. I know, I know. I, I thought it might this be controversial. <laughs> no, this is good. Um, this is healthy. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy for it. Um, one of the writers there is is doing a crime novel hmm. written in absolutely beautiful prose. And beautiful prose, and then sometimes like the dialogue is just very straightforward. And it works really well. But I'm in that place of saying, like, should you keep going? Because some of the writing group is saying like it's going to become inaccessible and it might become tiring after a like if you take a big chunk of story like ten thousand words, mm. might it start to lose its effect? Each of the beautiful lines together, will they stop having the same effect? And is it because it's a crime novel they tend to be a lot more faster paced? Yeah, but is all of that also good? Like, are people going to read it specifically because of the way it's written? And is it something that's not going to become tiring and going to remain? nice to read for a certain type of reader and it's really difficult to know yeah and then even if you were to read it and felt it was, it was a bit tiring 
that might just be your experience. Somebody else might be like, this is my favorite thing ever. I really, like I've not read it obviously, but I really want to tell that person like just write it because I haven't read right. James Joyce's Ulysses, but you know, it's got a reputation and I'll bet if he brought Ulysses to his local writing group, like I'm sure you guys are great, but they would have said like, what is this? Yeah. This is This is nonsense. This is a massive term of just babble and you know considered one of the literary greats or hang on one sec yeah okay as i heard a noise it was just the false man dropping in the letterbox <laughs> gonna chase away the local children with a stick i was 100 percent like if someone breaking into my house right now <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you seem very calm for someone who was about to just break out the, the bat on someone <laughs> I was going to say, do you use the cricket bat? But of course you wouldn't. Like, what? The shillelagh? The shillelagh? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the go-to? Like, it's not a baseball bat and it's not a cricket bat. Like, what's the go-to? A hurl, yeah. Or a hurry stick. Or do we even call it a hurry stick? It's the hurry H-U-R-L. It's like a baseball bat, but it's flat, so oh, okay. aerodynamic. Yeah. Every country has its, its go-to club. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, we're a terrible species. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Speaking of being terrible species, you just watched The Counselor yesterday, is that right? Yeah, I did. I watched it with my cousin. And The Counselor, those I don't know, is, correct me if I've got this wrong, Cormac McCarthy's first screenplay. So he's written, you know, The Road, No Country for Old Men, blah, 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 blah. And many of these have been adapted into films. And this is the first time he's written something specifically as a screenplay. I think you're right. I think it had been originally a play of some kind. I might be wrong on that. Ooh, or it, okay. it, it, I think it may have been written for stage, but I think that he was involved in writing it for cinema. So he okay. may have adapted his own work for the screen. But yeah. it feels like it could well have been something that was written for stage because an awful I, lot of I think it could conversations between the two people. Yeah, it is. And none of it's... It's all pretty simple, I think. You're right. A lot of it is just duologues. And directed by Ridley Scott, which feels like a weird mm. a weird combination like Ridley Scott this massive like big time Hollywood director who does like big budget kind of blockbusters and then Cormac McCarthy who is this quiet brooding intellectual who writes incredibly dense novels about human suffering but they did it yeah I saw it because you recommended it because you really rate the film yes I'd say yeah it's probably one of my favorite top five films wow yeah, yeah wow. I really really not, like it not favorite Cormac McCarthy films but just favorite films just generally one of my favorite films yeah okay i can't put a finger on why that is like most of my other favorite films i could sit here and list off all the things that were good about it i couldn't tell you what it was i think it's probably just the tone and the vibe throughout the film i quite like following the characters through the various conversations yeah god it's, i liked how it's, it's Cormac McCarthy, so it's pretty dark and it ends up having quite a it's not a rosy ending for a lot of the characters and that's something no. i quite like Oh shit! I mean, we should we should probably put a spoiler thing. Look, it's Corn McCarthy, so like, I think anyone that knows the guy knows that <laughs> it's not going to end well. But maybe just say now, like, there may be spoilers for any number of Corn McCarthy books and films ahead. Do you want to give like a brief overview of what The Counselor is about? Yeah, The Counselor is essentially a story of a lawyer who is getting involved in a drug deal. I say he's having something like six million pounds of heroin or cocaine transported in and he has just a couple of guys i guess who are involved in it with him essentially it goes wrong and then it's about the ramifications and the unraveling of events that occur as a result of it going wrong i guess that would be my description of it there's not much more to the plot than that it's quite simple yeah but it's all about the different characters lives and how the consequences of that hit each of them and stuff so mm -hmm. So it's dark and it's rather slow paced. Like it's not a big people running around and getting chased all, all the time. Like it's kind of a lot of people kind of quietly waiting for the hammer to drop, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's dark. It's not as dark as I thought it'd be actually, because I said, oh, I might watch this with Lady Friend. And you said, oh, I don't know about that. Like maybe, maybe don't, you know, I was thinking, oh, shit, <laughs> that right. was more because of <laughs> what am I about to watch? And it was yeah. dark. But no, that, that was more know? down to the, just one scene with Cameron Diaz on a car where I was thinking, Maybe not a great date movie. Uh, <laughs> that was my, oh that my, was my god! Take. I yeah. mean, probably shouldn't say what that is for multiple reasons. Partly because it's yeah. I laughed so hard. Like what? Yeah. What I'm yeah. with the guy's face is he's just looking up at the windshield. Yeah. <laughs> I don't the, even know yeah, what. It's a bizarre scene. It's very funny. But I was just thinking, like, Paddy's got it there on a date, and he's got yeah. to be like fuck James for suggesting we watch this film. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, okay, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for looking yeah. out for me. Though, um, yeah, so it's 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 very dark. Look, 
Did I like it? Yeah. Did I love it? Mm, no, I didn't yeah, actually. Yeah. And it was really stylish and it definitely had a vibe. But what I thought kind of let it down, personally, is actually, so it was very Cormac McCarthy. Like you're listening to this and it's like, oh, this is very Cormac McCarthy. The characters sometimes have these, sometimes they kind of monologue and it's yeah. these like their thoughts about life and death and the nature of, you know, to do wrong and to do right and the weight of human life and stuff like that, which was very Cormac McCarthy. But I didn't always feel totally natural to me. Like, okay. I don't know, when by the third time a character kind of just like dumps a philosophic diatribe, as well written as it was, I'm thinking like, I don't know, people speak like this. Like, yeah, I don't know, yeah, maybe yeah. they're all reading dense French philosophers <laughs> yeah, or something like that. Yeah, like, maybe this is what this is what like maybe this is what the upper 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 class do. They just sit around. I do, yeah, I, I don't know. I never get invited <laughs> to those parties. So maybe. No, I completely agree with you. Um, but it you know, when you say you really liked the specific tone that it had, like, yeah, if you don't take this as like, well, this needs to be totally hyper realistic, then yeah, the tone it, it was a vibe. It was a, definitely a vibe. I completely agree with that. And I think that was probably the reason that it's it's kind of had such a poor reception is because of all of that. When I read the reviews, a lot of the people said that they said it they found it too wordy, too plotting, too navel gazing. Yeah. And I didn't even dislike that. But that to me stopped it from being great. I found that I found it took me out of the film more than it yeah. brought me in. Yeah, I get that. I kind of expected that. Mm. Perfect, because it will lead into my point later on. Okay, um, good. I think, because I know we're going to talk about No Country for Old Men. Oh, yes. Because we've had very, very different feelings. Oh, oh, oh yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess I wonder how well the ending of The Counselor would have landed if they hadn't, to me, already built in a lot of these questions about life and death and, and things like that. That it would have been a, it obviously would have been more straightforward, but there's kind of a final monologue when he's on the phone to someone at the end, which I feel is kind of like the summaration of all of these questions that have been brought up throughout the film. And if it's what I'm thinking of, it was a really good monologue. Mm, it was really yeah. good. I feel like thematically, that scene kind of puts a bow on a lot of the questions which are raised in the film, which I quite like. Mm. So I think like the plot would have moved along a lot quicker. And yes, it would have been a probably a, a more accessible kind of film but to sum up the, the thematic stuff and some of the questions that have been brought up in the film i think that they needed to have those other conversations in order to have that that final monologue would have seemed a bit out of nowhere i, I don't disagree i i almost wish that that final monologue was the only time that a character did something like that so when we oh, reach okay. it it's like oh it's just this person that speaks like this this is really powerful rather than by yeah. the time it came i wasn't eye rolling exactly because i did enjoy all those but i was thinking like Okay, we're doing this again. Here it is. Even though that was the best of them. Mm. So Cormac McCarthy, he loves to wax philosophical. And he's great at it. He loves it so much. Like in Blood Meridian, he does it endlessly. And it's mystifying and beautiful. He does it in those books, though, other than The Judge. And The Judge is definitely one of those characters who has his philosophical diatribes. The Judge being kind of the bad guy of Blood Meridian, but also one of the main characters, this character who's like this philosopher, genius, sadist, amazing character. But most of it otherwise is done in the non-dialogue prose. It's done with Corn Picarthy just writing on the page. So I almost feel that with the counselor, he tried to get a lot of the non-dialogue philosophizing done in the dialogue of the characters, where otherwise it would have been non-character dialogue. And that, to mm -hmm. me, didn't quite work. It's, it's almost funny yeah. because it's like you watch it and it's like, well, okay, obviously Corn McCarthy needs to have this in his stories because he's even shoehorning it into character dialogue, yeah. you know, where he can't have like a narrator say it. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think if it had been narrated across what was happening, if it had been a... Well, no. No, okay. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, sometimes narration is done well in films, but, yeah. you know, I think... Interesting so many times it's not I, I don't know how they would have done it you know when we talk about no country for old men there is no overt narration and everything really just either through subtle dialogue or implied in the world building of the film okay we'll be we locked into no country for old men okay those are my thoughts about the counselor i liked it but ironically for me because i love his writing so much it felt almost too cormac mccarthy <laughs> you know it, okay. too yeah. heavy-handedly cormac mccarthy anyway yeah. 
Those are my thoughts about the council. Still liked it. Yes. I'd love for you to check out the Tin Red Line, which is a Terrence McKenna directed film. Yeah, you've mentioned this. It's a war film, right? It's a war film, but it does a lot of waxing. Okay. Waxing philosophical, waxing spiritual. You know, I, I, I do like some wax. It does so with voiceover, and it does so with voiceover over like scenes of what you would normally think are like the focus of, the, of a war film to be like a big action scene. It's characters engaging in gunfights and just running and shooting. And, yeah. But does this voiceover giving everything a different tone? Interesting. It doesn't go as, I guess, colorful as The Counselor. It's a lot more direct because it's really in the voice of the characters and it feels like these would be realistically how these characters would conceptualize what's going on. But it makes for a very different tone of a film. And again, it's a film that wasn't received very well. It came out the same year, Saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan had these big, sweeping yeah. action scenes, yeah. great characters, dramatic plot. Not especially very, deep. Not especially deep, no. And then quite a, like it's got a real drive towards their goal, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas the Ten Red Line kind of has no main character and is not really, like, other than the goal of engage in the military conflict and be successful, there's not really a goal. So it's just kind of, I think it's three hours of characters on an island, kind of. I, I have a very high tolerance for long films with characters just babbling. Yeah, see, I, I, was, so, yeah. I was actually surprised that it wasn't already one of your like well-known films. So like this okay. feels like right in Paddy's area. All right, yeah, I'll watch it and report back. Excellent. Will we talk about No Country for All Men? Let's let's do it. Cracking the knuckles. Do it. Here we go. Yeah. So you 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 lay us up. All right. Uh, great film. Great film. Really excellent film. Great. Uh, Capturing of a Corn McCarthy vision, excellently yeah, why executed. Don't give, why don't you give Corn a Brothers. quick explanation of it for any of the listeners who haven't seen it or want to recap? Okay, set in Texas, as everything he's ever written is, you know, just north of the border <laughs> with Mexico. <laughs> I, I don't know that. why, but it must have a very special place in his heart. A dude who's like a hunter or something, let's say he's a hunter, finds uh, the aftermath of a drug deal that's gone very wrong, and he finds on, I'm going to say, a dead man. A big suitcase full of money, chock full of money. And his mm. first thought is like, holy shit, a lot of money. And his second thought is, oh, they're going to come looking for this. But he takes the money. He does. And the rest is everything that happens as a result of that. Because, you know, the cartel, they want their money back. Also on his heels is one of the, he writes really, really good villains. You know, I mentioned the judge before. I'm going to say one of the all time great villains of i haven't read the book so i'm gonna say cinema anton chigar and i don't think there's any way of describing anton chigar and do him justice you just got to see the movie and and see this motherfucker because as well as having like the greatest haircut in cinematic history he is a, a terrifying force of nature and he is the character in no country for old men the film that is the one that delivers the philosophical monologues although i think they're short and i think that they they work for that character because that character is so strange. He's so out of out of place. He doesn't feel like a normal person. So when he says to someone he's about to kill, like, ah, that, look, I can't even do it justice, then it makes sense because it's like, yeah, this is what this guy's about. He is a philosopher murderer. So that's that's how I, that's my take on the film. Yeah. And I think we should yeah. probably discuss at first what we both like, like about the film. Um, okay. So everything is my answer. Everything, okay. As a... Yeah. Uh... Like as a setup, uh, the, both the counselor and No Country for Old Men have a great. A character makes a decision to kind of step off mm-hmm. the path, um, and then the rest of the film is just about the consequences that are wrought upon them because and, of that. And they and they both think that they can handle what's about to come. They're like, yeah, "Yep, yeah. I've got this. It's dangerous, but I can handle the risk." And it turns out, slight spoiler, that no, they can't. The men who are cruel men of violence are far more cruel and violent than they could be and it turns out that they just can't compete yeah which okay. i think is a returning theme of of his stuff yes and yes anton chigar is a great psychotic villain and you get a great oh, sense yes. of um his, his psychologic and what he's doing what he's doing yeah, yeah. oh and just um, quickly he his thing is he determines uh, a lot of outcomes by a coin toss he puts everything down to fate and it almost feels to me like I'm not the one making the cruel decision here. This is the coin. It was the coin that did it. Therefore, my my hands are clean. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very controlled, well-paced, pensive film. It does a lot of subtle storytelling. It doesn't dumb down what the characters are doing. It really, you know, you have the characters taking certain actions and you have to put it together for yourself, what it's doing. Yeah, great film, right? 
I absolutely, I think it's a terrible film. Um, I think it's a great example of how not to do a subversion. I think it's a great example of how not to do an adaption. And I think it's a really good tool, uh, a really good lesson for storytellers in considering um, shifts of genre or maybe like audience expectation. Because for me, madness, I see No Country for Old Men as an action thriller for the first act and second act and a really good action thriller for the first act and second act. And then in the third act, all of that stuff that we were saying about the counsellor, kind of these waxing philosophical, all this thematic stuff, the film then drops the action thriller plotline essentially and kind of leans into the theme all at the very end and starts kind of waxing philosophical for the last act of the film. And they don't they don't land a third act in terms of an action thriller. So for me, I see the film as this is what it is and it's telling you this is what it is, this is what it is and it's telling you this is what it is. And then it stops being that and starts being something else. Okay, actually, I think that's a pretty fair criticism. I don't feel it myself, but yeah, I, I get it. It definitely like all the action is in the first two acts and there isn't really a big crescendo. Like if you take the typical tension over time graph where, you know, you want the big swell of tension right at the end and then a big climax. No, it doesn't really have that. Yeah. Honestly, though. So I love the Coen Brothers and Coen Brothers films often don't. I feel like they just don't follow a typical pattern at all. Like if you've seen The Big yeah. Lebowski, I mean, it's yeah. you graph the tension of that. It's I don't even know what that is. It's not a traditional storytelling at all. And I yeah. love that. So I guess I'm, I don't know. I just like the way they, they tell stories. I'm not a Coen Brothers fan. Okay. Um, not yeah. even The Big Lebowski? Not particularly the big Lebowski. Okay. I recall watching it. Oh, interesting. Doing an impression. Well, the Coen Brothers are very Coen Brothers, so I, I can, yeah. I definitely get why people wouldn't like their stuff. I did like. I can't remember the name of it now. They made a series of it as well of the same name. Bogger. Bogger. Yeah, that's actually my least favorite film of theirs. So that's funny. Really? Okay. Yeah, um, I should see it again. To be fair, um, I heard the series yeah. is very good as well. I, I really disliked the series, and that's an issue I had with the film. And I had the series is that they say at the beginning that it's based on a true story. And it's not. And I think they do have to give themselves the license to not follow storytelling rules and still keep the audience engaged because the audience thinks this is how things happened. Mm, the Coen brothers have never asked permission to tell a weird story that doesn't follow rules. So I think they're just going to do it. They're just going to make a big Lebowski and say like, yeah, yeah, deal with it. We've made this. So I don't so know I about that. that. Uh, I found that disingenuous. Um, mm, okay. And I, I didn't like their vision for No Country for Old Men. Okay. Particularly because I, I felt they... They did something so well in the first two parts and then didn't do it in the ending. And I feel like their their out was like, this is the original story, but they had made alterations to the original story to lean into. They have this subversion kind of going into the third act, which is a lot more jarring and a lot more shocking in the film than it is in the book. Because in the book, every other chapter is from the perspective of the sheriff just speaking in first person to the reader about things he's seen during his time on the force. And the, the sheriff is the one investigating this whole shit show. And he's always yes. he's always just behind the killers. He's always he always feels like he's outmatched and he's outgunned and like I can't handle this. I'm just a small town sheriff. This is all just way beyond me. Yeah. In the yeah. film he feels kind of like the third most important character because he's not dynamically moving the story forward and he's you don't really see him go on a I would say you don't see him go on much of a character arc mm. up until the very end, and then you're kind of like, oh, there's something there. He is the third most important character, but he's also the first one that speaks in the film, the last one that speaks in the film, and he is always around to provide context for events. So I still, you know, so again, it's like, even though we don't have the the amazing non-dialogue prose of Cormac McCarthy in a Cormac McCarthy film, I feel like the sheriff's presence through the film really felt like it was giving us that by proxy. He provides enough context and commentary without it feeling heavy handed and too dialogue-y to feel like this is, this is the non-dialogue text of the book speaking. So I feel like his presence was all throughout it. Yeah, he wasn't the most important character, but I mean, what is he in, is he in the book? I would say what happens in the book, and that's interesting because I'm, what you've just described, I think, is, is quite essential for pulling off the ending that they tried to pull off. And I didn't feel that when I was watching, but then okay. you did. So maybe maybe this is just a lot more subjective than I, I was thinking. Well, I mean, in yeah, the book, 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for, for all well, my yeah, blogs, it's, it's, like, it's, of course, it's, it's subjective. It's, yeah. It's definitely subjective. Yeah. So in the book, kind of every other chapter is him. It is just a lot, a chapter of him, not waxing philosophical by any means, but kind of telling these stories, which are sort of giving a context of, you know, man is evil or something like that. The humankind is, is corrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. So something to, to that effect. And because of that, it starts to feel a little bit like the story that we're hearing because the story of um, what's the main character's name, yeah. Llewellyn and Shigur, that's all in third person. So it starts to give this feeling a little bit like this whole story is something that the sheriff is also recounting back to us. So spoilers for, for No Country for Old Men. At the end of the second act, they kind of set up that Shigur who was hunting Llewellyn and Llewellyn who was trying to escape, they kind of set up that these two are going to meet, that there's going to be kind of a, a reckoning between the two of them. and. In both the book and the film, the sheriff then arrives at Llewellyn's hotel, having kind of caught up with him, finding that Llewellyn has been shot. And in the film, Llewellyn is dead. He's shot dead there in the, in the hotel. In the book, uh, Llewellyn is rushed to the hospital and the sheriff hears from the first cop who arrived on the scene what had played out. And it doesn't go into details, but it still feels a little bit like you hear the events of what happened. And then the sheriff goes to the hospital and finds a little dead. So both stories have this kind of surprise that what feels like the kind of main driving force that kind of ends. But in the book, it feels way more like the, the story doesn't feel like it becomes inconsistent because we kind of get this kind of Mexican standoff at the end. We hear about it in third person. So it's not as jarring in a book to not see it because we're still okay. hearing about it so it still is told because in in the film would they just show him floating face down in a swimming pool dead we know what happened i don't think that's him i think he's he's in the doorway uh, okay it's been a, it's been a minute since i've seen it but the point is we, yeah, we just yeah. see the aftermath like there wasn't a yeah. contest he was just gunned down yeah in the book we get a little bit of a description of his heroic last stand he kind of gets shot you know he has a Thing where the bad guys walk away and he kind of rears up and gets a final shot off. Okay, so kind of I haven't read the book, but you know, I like it more as just like, nah, he just fucking died because it's such a good mm -hmm. subversion. If this were a traditional action story, then of course the hero would have a last stand moment and there'd be a showdown and he'd get a final shot off even if he doesn't succeed. But it's not. And I think that's kind of the point. Like, even though it does have a lot of the trappings of an action film, thriller film, it kind of is. But at the same time, I think it deliberately says, like, no, 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 this is much darker. Like, the hero does not get a final shot. The hero does not have a final moment. The Coen brothers said, like, no, guess what? It's not. All the action stuff is just being pure violence. The main character is just going to die. And we're not even going to give him the dignity of, like, showing a cool death. We're just going to have the main character rock up to the scene and show his dead body. It wasn't even a contest because in the end, it was never a contest. Llewellyn's just a dude. He's not ruthless enough. He's not cruel enough. He's not cold enough. He's versing someone who is all about this, who is kind of like the personification of ruthlessness and terror and violence. So yeah, he's going to die. And you know what? We're not even going to show the death. Like that to me was such a good statement. Grant that I haven't read the book, but to me, like when you describe like how that happens in the book, I prefer their version. I prefer their version. It's just like, nah, he just fucking dies. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Um, I don't like it. No, I know. For two reasons. And I think it's bad storytelling for one reason. Oh. I think it's bad storytelling because, like you said, it's not a typical action film, no. but it sold itself as a typical action film. It was marketed as a typical action film. I went to go see it in a cinema, so I paid to go see an action thriller. Well, we yeah. can't blame the marketing for the film. Like, the marketing might have been off. That's fine. Okay, that's the fine. Okay, the we'll, 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 um, that's obviously fine. I'll take the marketing out. But okay. the first act is an action thriller. Second act is an action thriller. So it is telling you it's an action thriller. Yeah. And then in the end, it says, yeah. well, I mean, we've got a guy. He's out running a truck, and he's getting shot in the shoulder, and he's being chased by a dog. And then he's cleaning the water out of the gun and then shooting the dog in midair. Yes, but from the beginning, you a, know it's going to be a very dark, a realistic, very different action. This is not thriller. a realistic look at, you know, it's it's hamming up certain things to be well, to be exaggerated action. I, I don't know that it is hamming things up. It's bleak, like it's bleakening things up. But I, I don't, it's not like he's running in with two machine guns, like dodging bullets as he's wasting cartel. No, what, what, he, what, he, what he is doing is 
like this is action. He's running into the horizon, there's lightning flashing, there's a truck chasing mm. him, they're firing off the roof. And that was an adaption from the book because in the book, okay. in that scene, it's a lot more of him hiding as the truck is looking for him. Okay. And the scene, the action scenes in the film are altered from the action scenes in the book because in the book, there are a lot more, the character can't see everything that's happening all at once. So the character is just getting little bits. You're aware that there's a shootout happening, but the story isn't about the shootout. The story is about the character running from the shootout, essentially. So the film does a lean into the action in order to be a big dramatic action thriller. And then in the end, it says, oh, you thought it was an action thriller? No, this is a slice of real life. Mm-hmm. But it was like, no, it hasn't been a slice of real life up until now. We've had, you know, him, the dog chasing him through the water and he gets out and he's managed to hold on to the gun. Like, that's ridiculous because it would fall out. And he mm-hmm. takes the gun apart and he cleans it and he blows air into the gun. And this is, uh, this is dramatic. It's a dramatic action. I, 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 all your points make sense and i agree i just feel like subjectively of course like we were kind of watching different films because as i was saying it like yes it felt action ish and not thriller ish but it almost felt more like a horror film or like the dark side of a thriller you know horace in the sense that like someone is running from the monster and like they might have little wins but in the end the monster's gonna get them right so well, i would say i felt they were telling a heightened action thriller and then in the end, they chose to subvert that because of what had what was already laid into the book. They just chose to, well, let's lean harder into this and then lean harder into it the other way. Um, well, I think, you're, you're, I think you're wrong for the right reasons. Well, my, my point on it being bad writing is that if, if it was anyone other than the Coen brothers, who are a big name, Conrad McCarthy, who was a big name, if you wrote you know, three quarters of a story that was horror, and then in the end you said, no, it's not horror because ghosts aren't real. If you wrote, <laughs> if you did, you did a first act and a second act of a mystery, and then at the end you said, well, some crimes aren't solved, you would be really letting down your audience. And I don't think you can stand back yeah. and say, well, that's real life sometimes. Like, I didn't come here for real life. I came here for a story, and you were telling me a story and then decided to not okay. give me a resolution. When I watched No Country for Old Men, I initially felt like they've, they've told a good They've told most of a great story, but they haven't ended it. So for me, a story is kind of the sum of all parts. If you're setting up a great antagonist and an interesting, dramatic drive, and the antagonist is kind of waxing philosophical, I'm, I'm waiting to see what you're doing with all of these pieces that you're putting together. If we're halfway through a film and I'm fully invested, which I, I was and have been in some, some, some of when I watched it, because your expectation is that the storyteller is taking you somewhere with all of this. So for the storyteller to get to the end and then kind of really drop the dramatic drive of the main plot line and kind of have all these pieces kind of scatter off in different directions and say, you know, sometimes that's life. It feels really disingenuous of a storyteller. And really, I find the last, I find the ending of the film really boring because once the drive falls out of the film, like we have an action thriller end, which easily five minutes of Tommy Lee Jones looking into the camera, telling us stories of his dreams, which again, in a book works because that's how the narration has been going. But for a film where you have, you know, characters shooting out of windows and driving and shooting each other as they're driving past each other and stuff, I thought it was bad storytelling because it wasn't even a subversion because it didn't set you up in the beginning to feel this is going to go in a different direction. It said, this is a really well told action thriller. And then it took a left turn in the last act. Okay. Good points. Well expressed. I get it. I get it. And I see how if one had come in and they felt like it was setting up as one thing, then, you know, that idea of the contract with the audience, you have a contract with the audience. If you promise one thing, you should deliver the thing. I, for whatever reason, didn't feel that that contract was there telling me that it was going to be this, maybe because I really like Coen Brothers films that I know what they're like. Maybe because I hadn't read the book. You'd read the book first, right? No. Oh, okay. I hadn't. I, I, okay. I hadn't read the book. No, I only read the book last week in preparation for this uh, this conversation. Okay. I just have one question, real quick. Um, are you a fan of action thrillers? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, I am. I, I like a thriller as much as Next Man, an action film. I thought yeah. you know Predator was great. Uh, Did you say Predator? Yeah, Predator. I it's doesn't a, think it's an action thriller. I mean, I would call that an action action uh, or a horror action. Oh, uh, maybe I don't know how you're defining action thriller then. An action thriller would be somewhere in between the big blockbuster action films and then the kind of quiet courtroom dramas 
or spy films, something that's kind of in between both of those. Okay. It's not all action all the time, but it is um, yeah. kind of like action light, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but to me, like, why it works is, I think, in retrospect, it feels inevitable. You know when they say, like, when there's a twist in a film, it shouldn't feel like it comes out of nowhere because that's just bad. It should feel like it's surprising and shocking, but then you think about it and go like, ah, well, in retrospect, they did say this and this and this. So even though I felt surprised, mm, I can see why this happened. This was set up. To me, that final confrontation feels like it had an inevitably, inevitability to it, even though it's shocking in the moment. You're like, oh my God, Llewellyn's dead. But like, well, we know that Shiger is an unstoppable machine. We know that everything was pointing to Llewellyn being kind of out of his depth and only just surviving by like the skin of his teeth. And there are all these warnings from um, the Woody Harrelson character who comes in and goes, you don't know this guy like I know this guy. He's a scary man. You shouldn't be up against him. Like there were warnings. So when Lou Allen yep. says on the phone, like, you son of a bitch, I'm, we'll see about this. I'm going to stop you. To me, it's like, well, no, of course he wasn't going to. He's going to get blown over like a little matchstick house in a hurricane. And it's almost like how anticlimactic it was just draws underlines under that point. Like, this was the only conclusion. Yeah. 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 I, look, I don't disagree with anything you've said, like, except just that that wasn't my experience of the film I, I didn't i didn't have those yeah. yeah the contract for me wasn't wasn't the same as it was for you i guess yeah i guess like narratively i see the appeal i just feel like they didn't land i feel like they didn't set up that ending that they were going to lean into i feel like they intentionally went the other direction because mm. i mean i'm just kind of repeating myself now like tonally the book i know that that's where the storyline ends but then the film continues to go you know what I mean? Mm. So for me, for me, when that happens, the rest of the film just feels like redundant. I'm just kind of waiting for it to end. Okay. Whereas in the book, there's a good chunk of story left, but it never feels like you've shifted focus that dramatically because we're still following Tommy Lee Jones along as he's, or the sheriff along, as he's trying to make sense of these events and stuff like that. Like there's a huge chunk of the end of the book, which is just the sheriff talking to the audience. And they've taken all of that out to just leave, like, the final, final thing that he says, which is about his dream. Which I loved. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, I, I did. I can't it, go left me, it left me with, like, shivers on my arms. I was like, whoa. Okay, that's just yeah. darkness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Mm. Didn't it start with him talking about his dream as well? It, it may have, yeah. Yeah, it did. I, I just felt. Yeah, he just, he just hated it. That's okay. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah, fair. I, I fair, fair. You know, it's 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 good to hash this out. Yeah, I guess I think that what I guess I, I we well, were saying their vision for it. Mm. My impression for their vision for it, and something that made it different from the way the counselor was handled, was because they took all of that. What you, if you were to put it in, let's say you put it in as narration, like they took all of that out in order to make a faster paced story, and then ended the faster paced story at the end of the second act, and then leaned into that slower stuff, and as a like as an artistic choice, I felt like that was very, I just felt like it was a sneaky way of having them have a surprise kind of, oh, look, the surprise in the ending. Whereas if they had, um, if they had handled Llewellyn's debt slightly differently, and then I think leaned into more of the sheriff's stuff earlier on in the film, it would have felt like less of a jarring tonal shift than less of a shift of the direction of the film. But I don't, I think that they intentionally didn't want that. I think that they wanted it to feel jarring. I, I think they did want it to feel somewhat jarring, but I still think that it felt jarring in the way that a good twist does, where it, there is a jarring moment, but then you think about it and it's like, ah, that's, that's, that's how I felt. But again, it's such a Coen Brothers thing to do. They love to have like one mm -hmm. big twist and another big twist and another big twist. And by the end, the whole thing is like a, an interesting pretzel. Yeah. And I think the pretzel was delicious and I would eat it again. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. Because I tend to write dark endings and I tend to like to write the characters. Not, yes, you not do. Pulling it off no, you don't. And my fear is that I would handle it the way the Gone would have handled it. My fear <laughs> is that I would have set things in place where it was like, it's going somewhere. And then I it just, yeah, so look, I pulled the rug out from under you and 
life is dark that's the way it happens <laughs> also i know i'm just done dumping on it now but um it's okay no you, you, you say they... now but you've been doing it for the last 20 minutes but that's okay you know i know but i feel like now i'm not not i'm, I'm not constructively dumping on it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. i'm just airing grievances just shitting on um, it the, the fact that there was a lot of philosophical stuff brought up felt to me like it was turning into a, a this philosophy versus that philosophy kind of thing yes and in particular, I feel like if they hadn't had that scene between Shigur and Llewellyn on the phone, and maybe the, the Woody Harrelson scene, then Shigur and, and Llewellyn on the phone, and that's like directly from the book, so they, they obviously were being faithful. And mm-hmm. um, it felt like it was becoming a conflict of philosophies. So then for none of the philosophies to ever really go up against each other, felt to me like, oh, but, but, but they, feel like but they did. you set something up and then dropped that. They did go up against each other, and the, philo- the Shigur's the philosophy of absolute ruthlessness just just blew over the other one yes but he did he did manage a few shots it was one of those things where like you could just as easily have interpreted in it as no he in the in that he shoots him in the film as well because shigur has to go and get himself see. medicine yeah he blows up a car uh i think him. that happened earlier i think that might have happened that earlier. was um he was tracking him if you remember because he had a beeper in the suitcase mm-hmm. Remember the, the hotel where Woody Harrelson gets shot the night before Shigura comes in and there's a shootout there in the hotel. Okay, look, I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, okay. I, you know, I've so seen this the... movie like two or three times, so I, I should remember this, oh, okay. but for yeah, whatever reason, no I don't. Yeah, Shigura has to lay up for a few days. They, they both have to lay up after that conflict. So the, the film, like the, both the film and the book also has a sense of this character is starting to figure things out. He's starting to get a sense of the danger he's in. Like it is also like, he's too confident and it's like you're in way over your head Mm -hmm. but you could also interpret it as you know Shigur has like got the drop on everyone so far because people just aren't expecting this level of violence and depravity and now this character is starting to see what he's up against and now he you know for the first time he knows what he's pointing at Mm -hmm. because we've seen him as a character who's patient we've seen him as a character who's had made very sensible steps in order to stay one step ahead and we've seen Shigur kind of getting by on the fact that he's just, he just surprises people with what he's doing. So for them to set all of that up and then off screen, just have an end and not end with a climax, I just felt like it was insulting to the audience. Mm. Mm. Strong words. <laughs> In- interesting points, you know, maybe not, uh, maybe, maybe not totally, not totally true to the film, but yeah, strong, strong points. Um, definitely valid. Definitely valid points. Valid, vo- yes. And valid I think, points, I think, yeah. I think, worth, I think, worth considering for any, uh, any, any writers thinking of following in those footsteps. Yes. To keep in mind audience expectation and how the things might be interpreted. People might take a different leaning with the themes or things like that. So I, I will definitely concede that most writers probably shouldn't try and copy the Corn Brothers because the Corn Brothers are deranged in their storytelling. And they do it in their own special way. Which some people hate. Yes. <laughs> and some people love, but some people hate. Okay, so before we wrap this up, I really wanted to talk to you about uh, Blood Meridian, which is a book that I know we both love. Cormac McCarthy book. Do you want to give like a brief... Uh, brief synopsis? Yeah, synopsis yes. of that. I would describe it as a story in which... When is it set? It's kind of set around the 18th... I want to say the late 1800s. The late 1800s in no, America. No, yeah, late 1800s, yes. Yeah, and really? that feels right. And I don't know. I think it must be because it's, I think, just before the war with Mexico. I don't remember mm. my history correctly. I think it was just after the war with Mexico. Oh, was it? Okay, because right, okay. Anyway. That would be early. Anyway. It's some period of time. Texas, the cowboys, that's all you need to know. Yeah. And it kind of follows a group of, I would say, marauding cowboys who yeah. decide to go scalp south hunters. into Texas. Scalp hunters, yeah, to go in and, and take scalps in exchange for money because you can take the top of a head off someone and uh basically sell it back to america for money yeah um these guys head out and they quickly learn that you don't have to necessarily take the scalps off warriors you can just take the scalps off anyone who is a indigenous american mm-hmm. so it is just a bloody violent very dark tour across this landscape with these characters who were based on real people in history mm, um, the glanton gang yeah just follow the glanton gang and their horrible escapades and that's just yeah. absolutely harrowing yeah harrowing and i think almost famously very hard to adapt like at least look i've i've read articles and yeah. snippets and some some of the better reddit comments people saying like 
I think some people are saying, I hope they don't adapt this just because. Yeah, it feels how, impossible. It, yeah. it does. It does. So, so much of what the story is, is how it's written. Yes. There's kind of no plot. The main, mm-hmm. if you could call him a main character, the, the, the character that the story mostly follows has absolutely no internal information. You're not getting any. Oh, that's interesting. Emotions, any thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very, very different. Do you don't you don't get yeah. any internal information from any of the characters, which is very strange for a book, and would mm. seem like something that could be very easily adapted into a film, because a lot of the book is based on you being like, what are these characters thinking when they're doing this, and um, feels like something that could be adapted into a film very easily. Mm. Um, but then, so much of the prose, so much of the tonality is derived from the way the descriptions of the landscape is described. Um, yes, yes, sweeping, beautiful depictions of kind of Mexican desert. But also very bleak and alien. The landscape often feels yeah. sometimes very beautiful, but sometimes almost like an alien planet. It's hostile yes. and Incredibly arid hostile. to yeah. the point where it seems like humanity shouldn't be there. And the humanity that is there is so terrible that it almost feels supernatural to me at points. It almost feels otherworldly. Yeah. There is a sense of, I wouldn't, it's not heightened realism. It's almost like, Surrealism, dream-like surrealism. Yes, that's much better. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, the whole thing kind of feels like a bit of a fever dream. Yes, yeah, exactly. It. Yeah, yeah. The kind of sudden acts of horrific violence. So, just like in terms of an adaptation, you know, people say like, "How would you do it?" So, it's something I like to come back to again and again because it feels like kind of an impossible little puzzle. Mm. And I look at the other Cormac McCarthy works and how they were adapted, and I would say the first half of Old Country for Old, No Country for Old Men, is um, kind of just taking like literally what's happened, literally what's on the page and depicting that. And that works quite well um, for the first two thirds of the film. And then the counselor is something that kind of leans more into the, the waxing philosophical and stuff. So I was always wondering, like, how do you really marry both of those if you were to try to tell a story of, for, for Blue Meridian? And my approach and my, my thought process with it was to slightly change the characters that are followed. You also got the judge who was a wonderful antagonist and I would essentially leave him the same because he feels so cinematic. You have the kid who is potentially a character that I would consider not having in the film. Oh, I think you need I, I think you need him. Need him? Okay. Who, that's, who that's else would you like, who else would you pin your empathy and humanity to? Maybe to focus or maybe in conflict with one another. Okay. So the kid for anyone this thing is um he's the character we start the story with and he's essentially just a boy who gets like almost accidentally conscripted into this gang. He sort of falls into it. So he's sort of the tabula rasa, like the blank slate. He we know from the start initially he's not a bad person because he's just a kid. He's literally like 14 or something. And we don't see the story through his eyes necessarily, but we follow him. So he is sort of he's almost like the one character that isn't a monster he's not the only character but he is not a monster so by following him we're able to like delve into this terrible terrible world and not feel just like disgusted immediately and want to close the book is that is that kind of fair uh, and personally i thought he was one of the worst in in the bunch um oh okay but that was that more more for my interpretation of the ending so i guess just in terms of kind of trying to create a, a bit of a narrative flow for a film I would view it as a road trip movie and a road trip movie mm-hmm. you kind of want to have a little bit of a back and forth between the characters so i would probably have just written in maybe one or two characters who are the boy and the priest yeah um are they like continuous throughout it i don't know if the priest is continuous but he's in enough of i think the latter parts of the book to i mean maybe you could write him in earlier but i remember yeah. the priest is kind of like the counterpoint to the judge the judge being this like terrible menacing evil 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 man and the priest yeah. being I mean, not as I, bad. I just think yeah. that that would be my arc if I was trying to put it in, that it would be one character who starts off not great, but not as bad as the rest of the characters, and then slowly starts to like become part of the group. And that's kind of the thing that you're hinging your, is he going to end up like the rest of them, or is he going to walk away, or is he going to stop any of this? Um, well, that to me would be the kid, but... Okay. I guess I just feel like, I guess I feel like because the kid is kind of a blank slate, and he didn't have any major conflicts with any of their characters. I would, I would try to just depict. I would, because I would try and be developing some of the themes that Cormac McCarthy is developing in his prose. I'd be trying to get characters to be a vessel for those themes, mm-hmm. rather than having like a ton of narration go across the whole film. Mm-hmm. I would try and have characters who 
maybe don't have conflict with each other, but maybe their internal monologue is narrated across what's happening and you've got a bit of a conflict of ideas. This again is, is why I, I was suggesting to check out the Tin Red Line because I would okay. actually approach it very much like a cross between the Tin Red Line and that film Hostiles, the, the Christian Bale one. I don't know if you watched that one. No, I haven't seen it. Superb. Okay. But I guess I would be taking the themes and the tones of Hostiles and like, you know, it's, it's, it's also kind of a Western and that I would be putting the storytelling of the Tin Red Line on top of that. The Tin Red Line was quite unusual how it ended up in its final stages because it was originally going to follow the actor Adrian Brody. He was okay. meant to be the main character in the film with the other characters kind of circling around him and made kind of Jim Caviezel the main character. Didn't tell Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody found this out at the premiere and he's not the main character in the war film. <laughs> and right. The film tends to be about the conflict with the characters' different philosophies and their attitudes and how they're conceptualizing their place in the war and stuff like this so that would be something that i would try to do with blue meridian if i was trying to turn it into a writer for screenplay mm. what are your thoughts on an adaption of the meridian apocalypse now have you mm. seen apocalypse now love apocalypse now yeah, yeah me too it's it's you yeah. could say it's a road trip film except it's a bird trip absolutely is absolutely yeah it's very fever dreamy there's lots of montages, especially toward the end, and the landscape is absolutely a part of that film. You know, wow. it's it, it itself is an adaptation of Heart of Darkness, where uh, like an imperial, I don't know, explorer or something goes further and further into down the Congo, into Africa, the jungle gets deeper and deeper, and he gets further and further away from the sort of civilized lands, quote unquote. I would draw heavily from that, make the landscape a big part of it, make lots of like montages with music over the top, make it a kind of psychedelic fever dream and everyone gets crazier mm -hmm. and crazier, more and more desperate. Yeah. Okay. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I, sh I should probably say this now, I am not a director, but that, that would be how I would sort of approach it. When I, yeah. when I read that book, I had such vivid, I don't know, I guess it's his writing, but to me it was such a vividly powerful book. Like I could see those that's scenes. I can see that desert in my mind so strongly. So I can almost see the scenes of the film in my mind. And it's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of things like scenes blurring into one another. And it's a lot of like beating sun and someone's haggard face fading out into like a, a shot of the sun, stuff like that. God, I don't know yeah. if any of this makes sense. I think this has been a bit of a fever dream explanation, but yeah, I think the cinematography would have to do a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, I, I, I hope they do it. If it sucks, I won't watch it. And if it's great, then it's great. And you would yeah. have to get the perfect actor for the judge. You yes. Have to absolutely nail them. And I, I don't know who you'd get. But. Throw out a suggestion there for the judge. So I just okay. let the, let the, maybe the listeners, they can, they can give us their, their take or their vote on it. Yeah, give us your judge person. suggestions. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll pitch them to the director. I mean, I could see Woody Harrelson doing the judge, honestly. Did you ever see um, Out of the Furnace? No. Out of the Furnace is good. Woody Harrelson is a menacing force in that. Oh, but his, his opening scene is him like just assaulting someone at a kind of cinema. Um, I guess if I think about him in Natural Born Killers, he was very frightening. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And he had that, he had that look. He's he got did. a menacing bald head. He definitely good. has a menacing bald head, yeah. Yeah. It's need to him to gain a lot of weight and get very, very pale. And then, bam, you've got yourself the judge. Mm. Potentially, I, I don't know. I, does he have gravitas? Maybe he has gravitas, but the judge is all gravitas. So yeah, he's kind of hammy in places as well, though, wasn't he? I could see. Oh uh, yeah, I could see what doing yeah, that. yeah, yeah. He was sort of jolly at times, which just made it all yeah. more cold. Ooh. Yes, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, I hope I do hope they do it. I Someday they're know. bound to with the way they're mining for stars at the moment. <laughs> <They're> honestly, <laughs> yeah. this has been good. This has been good. We we finally. Yeah. We finally hushed it out. You know, this was the final yeah. boss battle. And we were, yeah, I mean, there's more agreement than I thought there would be. I thought no, I, yeah, I do agree with your points. I just think like we, we came into it with very different feelings. Um, very different. And that is okay. Yeah. Uh, we're pros and cons. We're normally a podcast with up to six of us, but today it was just James and I one-on-one. -on -one. We've written an anthology called The New Mythic, which is horror, sci-fi, fantasy, available now all places where you get books or audio books, because it's a fabulous audio book as well. If you liked us, Give us a review, give us a rating, give us a comment. It really helps us out. And we will see you for a less free form, more structured episode with more participants next week. And until then, keep writing.
keep writing, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for listening and uh, catch us next time. Bye-bye. You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Precipice Fiction Podcast.